everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me to present to you this evening. Uh, I don't know how much people know about the background behind the company, so I effectively plan to have a, a brief intro to um, how the company's formed, um, where it operates, uh, go through and look at some of the challenges in operating electric buses. Um, it's, it's a unique set of challenges that you have. Uh, I'll um, then move through, look at some of the products that we've got, how we're transitioning, uh, cover a couple of uh, technology points, uh, and then I'll finish off with, I want to um, sort of go through some of the safety components that we've, we're building into the vehicles, because I believe that to be quite important in how to help uh, sell the technology. So uh, this evening I'm very much focusing on, and on we're looking at the, well, some of the language we're using is energy independence. Um, we're, not, we're not so much focusing on saying it's battery because in the heavy vehicle sphere, uh, hydrogen is developing very quickly in fuel cells. The main advantage of hydrogen over uh, batteries is that when you start getting to the size of vehicles that we're, we're talking, you're running about three tonne of batteries. So if you're running a delivery van, that's three tonne of goods that you can't take. Um, if you move to hydrogen, you, you can take an extra one and a half tons of um, goods uh, with, without compromising your um, energy uh, provision. There's a couple of other components um, which we're focusing on, which are sort of the USPs of our vehicles. Uh, these are going to be very important going forwards. Uh, connectivity, being able for people to be able to see status of vehicles, that's more important because you can't just pull in, give it a splash and dash and go, like with diesel operation. Architectural flexibility, I'll cover that shortly. And um, the other thing is sustain sustainability by design. Uh, I think Christian's come along and talked to you previously. The owners of the company very much believe in, we're not doing this just to ride on some coattails, they actually want to improve and drive and be a beacon for a sustainable development. So a lot of what we're trying to do here, uh, not just in moving to zero emissions, but we're looking at the materials that we use, we're looking at how much carbon is going into the, the manufacture of the vehicle, and I'll, I'll cover that off as well um, as we go through this evening. So <clears throat> where we are, we're, we're actually, um, when uh, Christian was here before, we were called Precision Buses. Uh, precision Buses have effectively reverse merged into uh, Bus Tech, which is based in on the Gold Coast. And so we've got two factories, um, both of which have the capability of producing around 100, 150 uh, vehicles a year. We also have a supply deal um, in Tasmania, and we are um, building vehicles in Tasmania as well. This is actually quite interesting for ourselves because we've got different governments, state governments with different policies. So um, the policy changes are not just whether they want to use electric or hydrogen, but the way they want to use electric as well. So some people want to have a fast charge system, some people want to have an overnight system. So it really starts to push us to look at what Australia is trying to do uh, in general. Uh, the other thing is, is that we have been building our engineering team. So um, I joined about a year ago, and I think there's three engineers. So through the COVID, we've, we've been quite happily uh, growing and developing the team. We're focusing, traditionally bus building has been a mechanical discipline, um, relying heavily on mechanical engineers, and we've been moving more and more. The majority of our hires have been our software engineers and electrical engineers. As we move through, um, uh, also bringing um, electricians on board as well and training people up on working with high voltage. So there has been a fear factor that we've had to get through on the factory um, to start with. No one would go near anything that was bright orange. <laughs> um, but we're slowly starting to build confidence up, making sure people understand how they can work safely. Uh, we actually have a prototype area that we've established out um, in Edinburgh and uh, we've effectively uh, de deconstruct all of the, the vehicles. We've got test programs and we can do a lot of testing. So uh, we're not just building the buses, we really are focusing on, on the engineering side of things as well. So uh, just to move on to, uh, this is sort of a, a covering off of what we're seeing in the Australian market. Um, we have a director of sustainability Kaja, who is very keen on ensuring that we enforce the culture of why we're here. 
So a lot of uh, our initial focus is on um, carbon reduction and making sure we've got appropriate practices in place to mean that the way that we build the buses also uh, does a carbon reduction system as well. <clears throat> when we start looking at the challenge in, in the Australian market, uh, there's about 100,000 buses in the Australian market. Uh, majority of diesel, uh, there's a lot of compressed natural gas. Uh, there's probably about 100 buses in total um, in, as, as far as electric buses go. Uh, there's one hydrogen bus that's been brought in um, I think they're, they're going to slowly expand to a, fl a fleet of five. The challenge that you've got with hydrogen is infrastructure. So with electric buses, you've actually got access to the energy a lot more. So there is a, the, being able to roll out an electric program is reasonably easy uh, because of access to electricity. With hydrogen, uh, an electric bus will use about 40, uh, 40 kilograms of hydrogen a day. Uh, to put that into perspective, it means you can run about 10 buses off of Tonsley. Um, which won't which won't fill a depot. So hydrogen actually becomes more cost effective at scale, but it requires a lot of investment to get there. So what we know is that when that tip, tipping point starts, we're going to see a lot of vehicles stop using batteries and move to hydrogen. But there is that case of trying to work out where that point is. And we're watching very much different governments, uh, state governments, uh, look at different investment programs and looking at where they're putting the hydrogen systems. So coming back to the sustainability of manufacture, um, we've effectively, what we've got here is, is, is three demonstrable buses being built. Uh, the, the bus on the far right is a diesel bus. Uh, the centre bus is a bus that's being um, built by ourselves but operated in Victoria. And the final bus is a, built, a bus that's being built and operated in South Australia. So most people talk about the blue bit, which is if you get rid of the diesel, you make all of these savings. But when you look at the manufacturing costs um, and the, the carbon that goes into manufacture, that you'll see that um, there's actually a significant amount of carbon that's being released in the, in the production. Um, sorry, this is of the production of the energy, not of the vehicle. Okay, right. So, on the far right, you've got the blue is the diesel and the orange is currently not carbon on Australian shores. That's something that will be done in the Middle East as they generate the diesel and then they ship it into Australia. And what you can see here is in Victoria um, versus South Australia. Australia is do South Australia is doing a lot better at its uh, carbon neutral energy generation. So behind the scenes, we're also looking at how the energy is generated um, with how the vehicles are used. So in trying to influence that, um, we're also trying to track what policies are going on. So I've mentioned that we're manufacturing in Tasmania. Uh, you'll see that Tasmania is looking at 200% renewable. That means that Tasmania is generating enough energy to cover itself and still have enough energy to export. So this starts to come over some of the challenges of hydrogen. Hydrogen is not, a, not an efficient way of storing energy, but it is a very efficient way of moving energy around. And that's why you get some, a place like Tasmania, which if they get into energy surplus, can start to look at what can we do with that excess energy. And that's when hydrogen starts to become far more attractive and the hydrogen market will, will grow as a result. So uh, Tasmania has a very um, strong hydrogen strategy. Uh, Queensland is also developing and South Australia as well. So this is where we have to be very careful on the vehicles that we build because we focus too much on batteries, the market will shift. Uh, on the left, we've got um, uh, various uh, energy sources and how they're being, being used by different states. Um, so coming back into where the targets are, uh, we, are we are tracking, this is uh, electric vehicle policy. Uh, we also have hydrogen vehicle policy. They are all competing with each other. This is where it is, it is actually quite difficult to try and forecast where things are going at present. Um, but that's what we're working through. And coming back to the flexible fleet, we're trying to ensure that our fleets are able to be adaptable so we can build an electric bus and it can transition to hydrogen um, at when hydrogen becomes more acceptable. So moving on to that, looking at the product transition. Here are the two, um, I'd say, premier um, buses that we're building at the moment. On the right, you might have seen 
Uh, I think there's four or five of these in Adelaide at the moment. So these are the Scania hybrids. So the green cover on the front, um, on, the, on the roof of the vehicle, uh, covers a couple of small batteries. Uh, and the vehicle can run in full electric mode, uh, which it does at slow speed. Uh, and it can also do rege regeneration uh, when, when braking. Uh, we've also got, uh, um, so that's, we've got two types of vehicles that we build. That's where we, uh, we import a Scania chassis. But it's all Scania technology. Uh, we build the body onto that vehicle. Um, and then it's uh, transitioned into the, to the state government. In Tasmania, um, that vehicle is completely designed by ourselves. Uh, we're working with Cummins, that's a diesel, bat, uh, diesel vehicle. We're about to launch the next version of this. It has a um, much, it's, it's been improved significantly cosmetically, but the other changes that, that have been done on this vehicle is the steel has been strengthened down the side of the vehicle. And we've put more mounting points in the roof. So this vehicle can actually be, even though it's diesel now, can be transitioned to an electric vehicle uh, going forwards without having to uh, replace the vehicle. So coming back to some of the sustainability challenges we're, we're trying to trying to meet. <coughs> some of you may have seen this around Adelaide. Um, this is effectively our DIT research bus. So we've got two of these. We had one in Adelaide and we had one in Queensland. Um, we've brought the one from Queensland down. Uh, they, they were used for demonstrators to try and get people uh, familiar with electric bus operation. I've got to say, I think we learned an awful lot more about electric vehicles than anyone that used them. Um, these are, they, they ran Toshiba batteries. Uh, it's an LTO chemistry. I th off memory, I think it's about 150 kilowatts. And this is when we listened to the operators and the operators said, we want a bus that we can use like a diesel. So um, the batteries were designed to be low capacity, fast charging. Uh, it's an AC charge system. We installed a 50 kilowatt charger. Found that it wasn't really that fast charging um, given the capacity of the batteries. We've also found, um, we, we got through a number of things with when it broke down, no one would touch it. Um, so we've had, to, we've had to learn how we do diagnostics with the vehicle uh, and help educate people on how to isolate it correctly. Uh, and the final thing was is that when it breaks down, everyone that runs buses is a mechanic. Not very many people are electrically minded. And so when it broke down, um, it would have uh, an overcurrent, generally minor. One thing that we learned is if you have an electric problem, don't put a bright red um, uh, dial on the dash that says electric fault. <laughs> You'll see how fast people can get off of a bus. Um, so most of it was just where there was a safety system, um, had a check, which um, you could go and clear. But we've, we've learned about how to display faults to people, how to help them to understand how to use the vehicle. So these two are, back, uh, are both in Edinburgh at present. We've removed um, the Toshiba batteries from one of the vehicles. The second one we can still use for demo and we're doing some testing with it. Um, we're not using it for electrical testing at the moment, we're doing some other innovation processes. Uh, you will start to see this bus again. It's, it's going to be renamed the Bus Tech Lab, and it's what we're going to use to do all of our research and development going forwards. So um, it's effectively the engineering team's bus, which I'm quite happy to, to say that we've got to use. But we will be using it when we need to trial new technologies, and we'll, we'll be putting them on there. One of the areas that we're very focused on working with is on the roof. Uh, the biggest impact to vehicle efficiency, which is what we learned with this, is the air conditioner. You get a really hot day, it will go 40% shorter because of the, the you've got several kilowatts running through the, the air conditioner. It has significant impact on it. So there's been a number of significant learnings that we've had from this vehicle. Um, and the basis of the design we're carrying forwards into the new vehicle, but the vehicles themselves, like I said, are being turned into research vehicles. So if we go on to what are you going to see on the roads shortly, um, we have the Europeans have all um, been bringing their vehicles in and we're going through very early work. So all of the traditional European uh, vehicle supplies, uh, they'll be coming down. We've got Scania and Volvo, uh, they know how to operate in country. Some of the uh, other newer starts, um, Arrivals, Abuscos, some of these, these other electric vehicles, uh, are actually through a, a weird ADR bylaw uh, blocks because they're actually too wide for Australian roads. So it does mean that it gives us um, a chance to be able to develop our own electric vehicles to better compete with the internationals when they come in. 
And this is the race that we're running through right now, is to try and build a bus of equivalent quality and standard to an, to an international vehicle. So we've got our ZDI. Uh, this is a render. Um, we have, uh, we're building the first production one in the next quarter. Uh, we're, we're building actually a set of them. We know enough about the technology that we can commit to a production run. You'll see that from the previous buses, uh, we're using a number of properties around electric buses. We're making them more open, more airy. We're also trying to make electric transportation more inviting. One thing I would like to point out, which is different with our bus versus some of the Scania vehicles, is because of the way the European vehicles work, all the batteries are in the roof. And I'll go back to, you've got three tons of batteries. So one of the places that you don't really want to put the batteries is in the roof because it really ruins the center of gravity. So what we're finding is, is that European buses are getting uh, OK range. They, they, we, we can compete with them. They've done a lot of um, air conditioning integration. But um, well, if you look at the Chinese buses, which don't put as strong a suspensions in, we're finding that electric buses are suffering from numerous failures uh, through mechanical failures by the amount of mass that's moving around on them. So what we've done is we've um, actually placed the mid, uh, a fair portion of the batteries uh, between the wheels under the floor. And we're the, only battery, uh, we're the only bus in Australia that will have the batteries that low. So you get a much lower center of gravity. It doesn't work the suspension as hard. You get numerous other energy savings from that. So that's a significant difference for our vehicle. It also means um, that you get a lot more height uh, so we've, we've got one of our first um, prototypes which we brought down from uh, Brisbane and uh, it's got the height of a normal room inside of it so it, very, it feels very big. So I'll just quickly move on to so what technologies are we, are we currently working with and what ones are we currently researching. As I mentioned earlier, we've got a fun game to play trying to pick the right technology. So. We're also finding that Australia is different to Europe. Uh, Europe is quite dense, you can drive quite quickly, you can't really leave the population behind. We're finding that the, a lot of the models for electric buses in Australia are, uh, are focused around city centres, whereby you've got access to a lot of infrastructure. So a route bus around the centre of Adelaide, for example. We are looking at a lot of vehicle usage and a lot of vehicles get used as school buses, which are regional routes and get used completely differently and tend to be more of a star network. Everyone drives out in the morning, comes back again. And if I pick something like Ballarat or Mount Gambia, you'll find that what's a school bus in the morning um, will be used as uh, a, library, a library bus uh, through the centre of the day and we'll go back to a school bus in the evening. So not traditional European uses. So we have to make sure that the technologies that we use are able to be adapted as such. So as a result, we've ended up with three different uh, technology proposals. We've gone for a high capacity vehicle um, which is suitable for being used in Adelaide where it will go up to 300 kilometres in, in, in one shift. Uh, we're looking at a regional vehicle which has uh, a different construction. You can put um, football gear in it, stuff along those lines. Um, and the final one which is represented by blue is that uh, we, we have a fuel cell system that we're playing with and, and starting to get our heads around and, and understand. Um, so, but that's, we're still very early days with that and uh, as with electric vehicles, um, ADRs are lagging well behind. So to operate these vehicles safely, we're putting a lot of effort in trying, uh, trying to understand which international standards we need to bring in and adopt because the Australian standards don't exist. The other thing is we've got different configurations, we build double decker buses, um, we're about to launch our first articulated. So we've also got different power. Um, requirements on our vehicles as well which we need to manage with with the, with the different energy types. So the first thing I wanted to quickly cover off is how our drivetrain works. So we're importing a German drivetrain. Um, it's, it's so good that the Chinese have, this is basically they've pulled this apart and if you see a BYD um, bus they've pulled this apart and rebuilt it from scratch. It looks visibly identical. So this is, tends to be the standard powered um, drivetrain which is used on most European vehicles. It has the, basically it has hub motors and it has um, electronics that control the hub motors to make sure that um, the energy is being uh, controlled between them, but there are actually two independent motors. The advantage of this is you can see that you have no central axle. 
So this is a this enables you to actually walk from the front of the bus to the back of the bus without a step. So it really improves the accessibility of the vehicle. Um, the, the the route bus showed that off, but it was quite funny because you're walking between the rear wheels. It's, it's an unusual experience to have the, the chairs up so high. Uh, the other advantage of an electric vehicle is it, it doesn't need gears because the torque is absolutely enormous. So one of the things that we've had to do with this is there's been a number of operators quite worried about tyre wear because of the ability to better spin the tyres up or not, um, not providing a, a smooth ride. So we actually have to severely moderate the torque curves on these motors to make sure that you get a nice smooth takeoff. Oh, one thing I should actually mention, we got, um, I'll just go back to the uh, hybrid. Um, we got a complaint for the hybrid. Um, if someone wrote into uh, Department of Transport and said that they were not very impressed with it. It was a, the worst bus that they've ridden, they've ridden on. And they said they're not quite sure what happened with it, but the engine kept on cutting out and we really need to go and have a look at the bus. So, <laughs> so that's, the, that's, that's one of the few complaints we've had about that. So one thing is, is that these buses, they are quite silent. And that's another, that's another differentiator is that when you get, to, when you get a, such a big vehicle um, and you take all of the, normally there's a lot of noise, there's compressors going, there's, um, the engine's quite loud. When you take the noise out, it is quite eerie to be in such a big vehicle that's so silent. So uh, we are introducing, once again, we're doing research into what we need to do. Um, Europe, Europe has already introduced AVAS systems. So uh, we've actually got a series of sounds that we're trying to work out what to use as the, as the vehicle approaches and drives off. Because the one on the right, you will get hit by it and not know it was there. Um, we've got everything between jets and sounds and um, we're trying to make sure it's pleasurable and we've been working with a few suppliers to make sure they're also um, the, the sound is directed because the last thing that you want to do is go to an electric vehicle and all the benefits of the silence and then have to put big loudspeakers all around it to let people know that it's there. So we're, we're doing specific noise uh, shaping as well to make sure that um, it's correct, correctly um, identified if it's speeding up, slowing down, those types of things um, all visually. And we're also doing some work with UniSA to work out ways that we can highlight visually on the vehicle, um, better ways of uh, knowing what, it, what it's about to do. A diesel bus, also you hear it rev up, you know it's about to move. These things just take off. So moving on to the batteries, uh, we're working with um, we've got a technology partnership with Proterra. We're actually co-designing the the batteries are being supplied, but we're co-designing the energy system with them. So we're not buying something off the shelf. This is where we're using quite a number of engineers uh, to work out how to integrate these batteries with what we would class as Australian conditions, the usage for Australia, what type of thermal systems we need to be able to manage the batteries. These are, we're looking at, we run two of the, sorry, four of the packs on the bottom. Um, we run two in, two in the floor and we have two in the roof on over the rear. These are all uh, lithium iron and uh, they've got full thermal management systems in there. So we can run this battery in Tasmania where it might be in the snow. Well, they've got a, they like to work at about 25 degrees, which is significantly cooler than a lot of other batteries, um, sorry, warmer than a lot of other batteries like to run. Um, but we can use them in Tasmania, they get warmed up. We can use them in the outback, they get cooled down. Um, we've been working through designing the, the thermal management system for these batteries as well. Each pack is about 700 kilos, so this also means that this is some new manufacturing skills are needed for us to be able to safely build these up. A petrol car is quite easy to know when you've got petrol and try it on the starter motor and, and diagnose. So we've been uh, in the factory building up uh, competencies to be able to build up the electric system, pre-test it, package it, and make sure it's ready for install. Along with Proterra, so these are these are the ones we're going to be using on the urban buses. Uh, with Pro, we're also working with Cummins, and Cummins is what we're going to be using on our regional buses. The Cummins batteries are smaller. Uh, oh, sorry, as far as charge rates goes, uh, it'll do one C at about for 20 minutes, and then it drops down to half C. So these batteries are designed to run all day, and then go back to um, the depot and be charged overnight. 
One thing that's different about our system versus the BYD system, these run DC charging, even the BYD DC charging systems don't allow moderation of charging. So these coming back into connectivity, these can be remotely controlled and across 100 vehicles, you can control how much you charge each vehicle and you can run an algorithm against it. Once again, these are some of the changes that we have, or challenges we have to address when you've got 100, 100 or so vehicles. We're looking at around 325 um, kilometers. So depending upon your temperature, um, if you get a really nice day, you can probably get over 400. And if you got a very, very hot day, um, it's probably gonna drop around to the, to the 270 mark. Uh, the other thing is, is the life of these batteries. Um, these batteries are warranted for 12 years. So that's the other thing is we're trying to be responsible with making sure that you're not changing batteries through every every three or four years. So uh, when you supply a bus to anyone anywhere in Australia, you, you normally are tied to a 25 year contract. So we've designed these bus, uh, these batteries that they'll only go through one change, which is also significantly better than diesel, whereby you might have four or five repowers, which is where they take the engine and put a new engine in the back of the bus. So it, it is a significant step forwards. Coming back to the Cummins, they're faster charging, but they're smaller. Um, these batteries have been specifically designed because they fit widthways across the bus rather than lengthways, so we can actually stack up and, and have smaller capacities. These are the batteries that we're planning on running in uh, regional buses and school buses. The other reason why we've got these is because they work really well with a, with a fuel cell system. So we can run one or, two, one or two of these batteries with a fuel cell. The fuel cell consistently recharges it. Um, and they've got really good cycling properties uh, when, you, when used as such. Moving on to our fuel cell, um, we've got uh, two fuel cells. Uh, we currently don't have them uh, enabled. Uh, we're focusing for the remainder of this year on ensuring that our uh, battery electrics work well, uh, but we are currently working with a number of hydrogen suppliers to be able to try and get a fuel cell system up and running as fast as possible as well. Uh, there's a lot more challenges. If you think electrics, uh, battery electrics got challenges, hydrogen has further challenges as far as ensuring that we've got um, appropriate safety uh, in place. So the final thing I wanted to do is just cover off what happens, at, how, how do we look after these batteries? So one of the things that we don't want to do is we don't want to have any safety incidents whatsoever. So the Proterra battery actually has uh, within within the cell, um, it's an 1860, sorry, 1800 cell. Uh, I've not worked out how many there are in a pack, but there must be tens of thousands. Uh, there's a diaphragm that's actually within the cell, and that's the first thing that goes. So as soon as they go outside their temperature range, they become inert immediately, and uh, they're very difficult to uh, ignite. You have to hold them at about 100 degrees for about 25 minutes before you get any form of thermal runaway on them. In case there is an incursion into them, they've also got a membrane around each cell to make sure that they don't propagate um, to, to, to following cells. The cells themselves are put into packs, the packs are then put into, sorry, into modules, and then the modules are then put into packs. So it's got barrier upon barrier upon barrier uh, through it, through which you actually end up with the pack. They're all um, cooled. There's, I've forgotten, there's a staggering number of sensors on, uh, that run through the packs and they're all controlled internally by their own uh, BMS system. So they, they very much look after themselves and they get tested in the most unusual way. So they get run underwater, they get run in high humid, humidity environments and so this is so we know we can run them in uh, Darwin and Queensland quite happily. But the most impressive thing is the impact testing. Um, they have ballistic grade aluminium, uh, both on the top and the bottom skins. And although the video is a bit fuzzy, uh, they do things like dropping manhole covers from three meters on them while, while they're operating without any issues. So the batteries themselves are incredibly robust, and that's to try and ensure that we have a very good representation of what a battery vehicle is. So that's the end of the sort of the formal part. So thank you very much. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. So the research bus is an AC charger. 
Um, both of the new systems are DC because you can't get the um, charging rates otherwise. So we're running, we're looking at uh, both bat both buses will run about a 250 kilo, uh, kilowatt charger. We are we do have a, a, a pantograph system that we're looking at that can do 400 um, 450 kilowatts. Have you looked at the induction charging at all? Or the pack pack on the loop or under the loop? We have um, at the moment. We, we so there's a an American company that's um, got a, a heavy vehicle induction system. Uh, we're we're tracking the technology at the moment, but we, we don't have any plans to bring it into the vehicles. Are there any thoughts on electrifying the Ozan system in Adelaide? So the I believe that the hybrid vehicles will be going on the the Ozan oh. because um, there's specific. Uh, underbody designs that you need, and so we know that we've been held to those underbody designs. So even if they're not on the Oban to start with, as far as electrification like trams, or it, it's not there, there won't be any electrification like that. Um, I, in my own time, I'm ruminating around how I can get a short, uh, a small capacity bus that can use our tram network to effectively charge as it goes through the centre of the city, and go out and then come back and charge again. Um, there's plans to put trams, or I saw a, a proposal to put trams up the centre of um, the parade. And I was sitting there going, oh, I think we can do something more fancy than that. Yeah. <laughs> Where we can use an electric trolley tram that can follow the, tro uh, follow the tram systems and, and move off. Do you have any dealings with uh, the Western Australians that are um, trying to incorporate um, hydrogen and the production of hydrogen from? the waste system of the city into their bus system? We are talking to a number of hydrogen. There's, hydrogen seems to come from some very interesting places. So uh, hydrogen is also um, not very green at the moment. That's why Tasmania um, is going to do very well uh, because they have excess energy and are able to produce green hydrogen. Uh, there's uh, Effectively, hydro is one of the one of the best ways. Uh, you've got the waste systems, so there is. Um, I think there's, they're looking at coming to Adelaide as well, whereby they harvest methane, and then they crack the methane and turn that into hydrogen. Yeah. And then um, there's a. I think East Waste is looking at using the hydrogen to run, so that the waste they collect effectively creates the hydrogen they use to run the trucks to collect the waste. Yeah. Uh, this is a publicly listed company, and it would be very expensive to do all this, wouldn't it? How are you the it's privately held, yeah. so um, the investors, uh, the investment comes from the owners. So how, how many owners are there? Uh, there's three three owners, and they have a, a, a capital fund, so which they invest across uh, numerous different areas. So yes, it, it's 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 no small undertaking, um, and I would say that the, the original the, the original bus that we did was. Um, developed in cooperation with the universities. So there was a way that the, the cost of that bus was moderated. And, but we're finding that uh, we're moving more and more away from trials. If people want production. We've learned what we need to learn about how to run a, run, run a vehicle. The other thing is, is that the, the battery, heavy industry battery market is maturing significantly. So Proterra has just floated. Um, there's a number of uh, energy companies that are looking to supply into this space. But yeah, the, the vehicles themselves as well will be um, significantly more expensive in the outlay um, than a traditional diesel vehicle. That's actually one of the th another one of the balances that you've got in that a pantograph system has expensive infrastructure, but you can run smaller batteries, as opposed to an overnight system where you have uh, 450 kilowatt hours of battery. Um, so your buses are expensive, but you can actually save a considerable amount of money on your charging infrastructure. It, when you start looking at scale and how people want to draw energy, uh, if you got a depot with 300 buses, you don't want them all charging flat out. You, you, <laughs> you take out a suburb. <laughs> Yes, they're all, all of them are Australians. So, um, I, sorry, I didn't mention that um, earlier. With the, uh, they have a, 
Uh, Arrival um, has a, a concept about microfactories. Um, you look into the Arrival documentation in microfactory, they're looking at uh, building about a thousand buses, which is not very micro. Um, we have uh, more of a, it's, it's, it's a territory support policy. So if you look at Tasmania, uh, they've set up a factory in Tasmania um, to supply uh, vehicles to Tasmania. In doing that, they've, they've worked with local suppliers. And as we've found good suppliers of materials, like other local Australian-owned companies, and we find a good product, we'll actually import that, um, or sorry, use that throughout the business. So rather than that company having to go and find interstate sales, we'll actually draw from them and feed them into the other factories. So all of the composites that are on the Adelaide buses come from Tasmania because we found a good company there. We've helped them grow and supply into us. So they've got, they, they, they look at how we can support local, local manufacturing. Rather than trying to build big bus factories everywhere, we find that we can scale through our logistics rather than scaling through trying to find factories. So how many buses do you think you'll produce a year, ultimately? We're looking at, um, well, if you look at New South Wales, New South Wales has 8,000 um, public urban buses, and they believe that they're going to change them all out in 10 years. Um, I don't think that the minister's done the maths. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are looking at, we're, we're seeing that there'll be significant take up uh, we, we're not really look, looking at beyond 100, 150 buses per factory, but what we'd be looking at doing is, is growing factories, and we're working with a number of other states to build factories to support the states. Transition won't be just rolling out 100 vehicles. There's Even with electric, you putting the infrastructure in place. And I should actually point out that's one of the challenges the government has with, with infrastructure, because they have to put significant infrastructure in for a new electric depot and they're looking at the price of investing in hydrogen, and it's, it's, it's not an easy decision at the moment. I just wanted to ask about that hybrid bus with the batteries on the roof, totally foreign concept to all of us. Um, you said it could drive just on electric power very slowly. What kind of range does it have? Um, <coughs> I think it's only about 50 kilometres or so. So this, the European, the European ones require shade. Um, they all require active cooling. So even even these batteries require active cooling. Um, that's something else that we're trying to help people understand with a depot that a forty degree Adelaide evening. Um, a depot is going to sound like a wasp's nest if it's not careful. <laughs> <laughs> as all the batteries keep themselves cool while they're charging. It's another reason why overnight charging in Australia is actually not so silly, because you can actually moderate the charge and keep the temperature of the batteries down. Yeah, except in the winter when you lose capacity charging, it's really cold. That's different. We can actually warm the batteries up and draw that from the, um, from the uh, electricity supply. Yeah. Yeah. yeah our friends in Tasmania with conversions have got batteries in the Yep. Yeah, the, the thermal management system that we've in, we've introduced is has both passive and active, and it can both heat and cool. Okay, do we have any other questions? Last one, Matthew. Do you have any um, plans to use the natural energy, solar, wind, etc., to do all your charging for your batteries? Buttons? So we are looking at ways that we can work with people that are bringing in sustainable energies. So we very much are the bus manufacturer. Uh, the way that buses are sold, previously you would just say, I've got a diesel bus and do a tender. We're now finding that consortiums are more involved and a competitive consortium is someone that can use sustainable energy. So naturally the market's driving people towards um, energy management systems, which will move towards the types of renewables that you're talking about. Uh, because of the way that um, th there's also second lifing the batteries as well. Uh, so once they finish their first life, uh, we're expecting a lot of the depots will just maintain the batteries uh, themselves and then they'll start to build their own uh, battery storage on site. Oh, in our own production cycle? Uh, yes, we do have plans, sorry, as far as the, 
the production of the buses goes. Uh, we are looking at material management um, as far as how we build the vehicles. They're built out of stainless, they use welders. So we've got a bit of a challenge to be able to provide ourselves the energy needs that we've got. Um, we are looking at hydrogen as, as a way that we can demonstrate a clean factory. There's a number of a number of markets. We're actually finding that because the Australian government's announced uh, significant investment in renewables, it turns the eye of the world into this into this area. So at the moment, we're finding that we need to make sure we've got a quality product in in Australia. Um, but we have had expressions of interest from other countries that are also. Uh, Primarily right-hand drive, um, but yeah, the, the, we we have the we have the strategy to actually look at being able to export locally. I own a diesel bus. It's a four-wheel drive coaster. Yep. And I'm just wondering, are there what sort of ballpark figure to perhaps create a hybrid vehicle? Perhaps we're going through that right now. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, I did explain I can talk for hours. <laughs> one of one of the things that we noticed is that the reason why your buses, your 12 and a half metres that you're seeing around on the roads are 12 and a half metres is because it's sort of a natural, natural maxima for a diesel system. Um, there's an anecdote about the size of the space shuttle boosters being tied to the width of the behind of a horse. Um, we're seeing that 12 and a half metre buses have a very similar, similar anecdote behind them because they are bound to specific roads because they weigh so much and they can only have certain routes so we've bolstered certain roads with companies like Uber coming on we believe and demand responsive transport we think that buses are going to get smaller we can size buses much easier because we've got torque now with electric motors that you didn't have when you had a diesel motor so we're actually going through and reviewing it's quite a fun exercise looking at what ifs. What can we do with this that you couldn't do with a diesel? So we're expecting that um, buses, especially in uh, Victoria, we're expecting buses to shrink and they'll start to move into that, that type of area very quickly. Well, I think you might all like to join me in thanking Greg very much. Yeah.